And one of the things that research says is one person, one shelter, one ally, one person who listens to you, one person who cares about you, one person who has your corner, um, makes a tremendous difference in people's level of resilience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I think that like, that is incredible to think like you, you know, you're at the store and somebody's being a jerk and like, you can be that one person who like says, Hey, you're not alone. Hello, and welcome to episode 96 of the Living and Leading with Emotional Intelligence podcast. I'm your host, Brittany Nicole. Today, I'm really excited to bring Joshua Freeman on as a actual guest of the podcast. What I mean by that is Joshua has appeared on the podcast, but not as a guest. So Joshua was part of my book tour when I launched my book, The EQ Deficiency, last year or September of 2020 depending on when you're listening or watching this. And I used a segment of that book tour that Joshua was a part of as a clip for my Mindful Mention Mondays episode. But today I'm bringing him on specifically to be a guest for the Living and Leading with Emotional Intelligence podcast. So let me tell you a little bit about Joshua. So Joshua Freeman is a leading expert on applying emotional intelligence to optimize performance. As the CEO of Six Seconds, Joshua leads the world's most extensive EQ organization, now with offices and representatives in 25 countries. He's worked with leaders and teams around the world, helping them use emotional intelligence to get better results. His clients include FedEx, Microsoft, Intel, Amazon, all the branches of the U.S. Armed Forces, and the United Nations. So it is a great honor and privilege to bring him on as a guest. And without further ado, here is Joshua Freeman. Here we go. Well, Josh, Joshua, which, which would you prefer Josh or Joshua? You know, I'm really, I like them both. You uh, like them both. Okay. Yeah. We'll go with Josh since it takes me like less time to say it. <laughs> Josh, it is such a pleasure to have you full time on the living and leading with emotional intelligence podcast. And for my listeners and viewers full time, I mean, We've had Josh on the podcast as far as like clips of him talking about six seconds and emotional intelligence, but it was clips from my book tour. So now we're actually bringing Josh onto the podcast as a guest for his own segment. So um, Josh, I always ask my listeners to informally introduce themselves, meaning not necessarily what you do. You can definitely throw that out there, but who are you at your core? I'll start with an easy question. Huh? <laughs> um, <clears throat> I travel a lot. Well, before the pandemic, I traveled a lot. And in many countries, you know, when you're landing, there's a little form where you need to fill in like your occupation. Mm -hmm. And um, I was recently talking to my older child who said it was really difficult when we were growing up and my friends would say, oh, what does your daddy do? And I had a hard time answering that question. <laughs> and then... I'm like, yeah, kiddo, me too. <laughs> like, uh, I think most of the time I write educator. Um, I, I'm a CEO. I lead an organization that works all over the world. I'm an author. I'm a researcher. Um, I'm a master certified coach. I teach people how to coach. But <clears throat> I think the uh, at the core, my um, I spent many years as a, a classroom teacher, and I think in some ways at at the core, when I think of myself, I'm an educator. Yeah. And what would you say? As an educator, we're always learning from other people, right? I hope so. <laughs> Who, and I know it's probably going to be hard to just pick one, and this doesn't mean it's like the best or the top or anything, but who comes to mind when you think of the person that was the most influential in your life in terms of aiding in your knowledge? Hmm. Well, I'm not sure that knowledge is quite the right criteria for me. Mm -hmm. um, education... Um, well, let me just back up to say a, a couple years ago, I was in Japan and I was doing a presentation 
a workshop for school principals. And I used the word learn many times in the workshop. And I was out at dinner with the leader of Six Seconds Japan, and he said, you use this word learn, what does it mean? I'm like, what? What do you mean? What is it? What is it? He, he speaks perfect, perfect English. I'm like, what do you mean? What is it? What does learn mean? And he said, well, in Japanese, there are many ways of translating learn. Hmm. And I think I know what you mean when you say learn, but I would like to know what does learning mean to you? And Brittany Nicole, I have been in some way an educator uh, for many, many, many years. <clears throat> Nobody ever asked me that question. And it was, I mean, he was, what he told me is that in Japanese, there's uh, like the most conventional way to translate learn from English is manabu, which actually literally means to copy. Hmm. And kind of deep in the Japanese cultural understanding of learning is that you copy and you copy and you copy and you copy and once you can make a perfect copy then you can improve it or you can make small changes but um what he said i you know i don't think that's what you mean by learn so when i think about who has been a powerful teacher for me <clears throat> um like well it depends on what you mean by learn yeah and knowledge for me is the kind of um, the baseline level of learning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, wisdom <laughs> might be yeah. like the um, application of that knowledge towards a meaningful purpose. So I guess my question, if I were to rephrase that, who made a major light bulb go <laughs> off in your head? <laughs> Well, one of the one of the characters um, in a fairly unconventional way are my kids. Mm, yeah. And I remember writing um, when they were like one and three years old, a, um, a blog post, which I titled in a gentle way, you can shake the world. And what I realized is neither of them told me you have to change. Neither of them <clears throat> said, you know, this is this thing that you thought was true is not true. Now, I will say as teenagers, they certainly did that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, my view of what was important in the world had changed so much in those three, four years. Mm -hmm. And my sense was, it was almost like the stars realigning. Mm. And there were just, for example, I know a lot of people when they're thinking about having kids, it's like, oh, we can't afford it and I don't have time and I won't be able to sleep in. And it's like, yeah, all that's true. I thought those things mattered. And I realized they actually didn't matter to me. Yeah. So like that's the kind of realigning and just reshifting about what is, what is it? mean to be a grown-up what is important and by the way i'm not saying everybody should be a parent um i don't I, I, that was for me um neither of my kids have any interest in being parents and that might be <laughs> fine but it's uh, it's that that process of meeting them and learning how to be a parent for them and each of them has needed me to be different as a parent um, that's been a place of just unbelievable challenge <laughs> and, sure. and unbelievable growth. I'm sure. So you learned a lot from them. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. So in regards to the topic for today, you and I spoke very briefly prior to hitting the record button about everything that, well, it was more so with, with me personally, the things that I experienced strongly this past week. Um, and I know that you've had some things happen in your life as well that have kind of triggered this. And the thing that I really want to talk about today is the state that we're in as, as human beings. We're at a very crucial, critical moment in our existence. 
And there are many things endangering us, pretty much ourselves. <laughs> We're endangering ourselves. Um, there's environmental cause for concern. There's a, you know, I was reading an article the other day that said we have nine years left to reverse climate change. That's it. And if we don't do that in nine years, it's irreversible, period. Um, and that was terrifying for me. And when we speak about emotional intelligence, a lot of emotions came to the forefront and I had to figure out how am I going to handle these? It was easy to react to other people that were around me. And as someone who tries to practice what I preach, um, I refrain from doing that. But at the same time, I had to find a way to cope without dismissing the fact that this is our reality. And, and I think that's what we had discussed is kind of talking about how to be aware and not retreat and take action during these times of crisis, during these times of chaos and discord within our society, instead of that cognitive dissonance, if you no. will. Um, so and, as you yeah. As you think about your own experience last week mm -hmm. and <clears throat> kind of all of the things slamming into you, one option to that is is to become volatile yourself one option to that is to retreat mm -hmm. and you described or you mentioned this third option about engaging what does that feel like and look like to you it feels i feel terrified i feel like it's a small drop in the bucket for what needs to happen. And I feel helpless. I feel sure I can do my part, but it's going to take all of us to have that awareness and that, that um, urge to act. And I don't know how to spread that message. All I know is I can, I can control what I do and how I think and how I react, but that's all I can control. And that was what was so overwhelming for me hmm. was the things that were out of my control and what that potentially could mean. Hmm. I remember when um, M, my older child, was um, from about 10 to 14 doing a lot of public speaking about rainforest destruction. Hmm. And M has always been fairly anxious and somewhat introverted. And I said, how is it that you're able to do this? Like you're walking, you know, traveling internationally and standing in front of these audiences of kids and adults and, and speaking. How do you do that? And M said, <clears throat> uh, the orangutans, and this is like 12 years old, the orangutans can't speak. Mm. So I have to speak for them. Oh. And for me, that was an example of what we talk about in the six seconds model of pursuing noble goals. And it's not about um, it's not about uh, being a change maker through force. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's not about stepping. It's not about saying I'm not afraid. It's about saying there's something I have to speak for anyway. Yeah. So as you are in that place of feeling that smallness, what, what do you also feel compelled to speak for? Yeah, I mean, and, and I try to do that through teaching others how to be aware and understand their emotions and why we feel the urge to do the things that we're doing, like retreat, like react. Um, because I think all of us have a purpose in life and this is my purpose. You know, I don't need to go and speak about climate change to help change the world. I focus on what I know that I can bring to the table. And that is helping people with their emotions and awareness and understanding because in that it can help with climate change. It can help 
with social discord. It can help with all of those things. And that's what I know that I'm good at. And that's what I'm passionate about. And so I'm just trying to get out there and, and speak about it. You know, tomorrow I'm doing two speeches and then um, I've got some other things lined up. And, and that's kind of my goal is not to, like you said, by force, tell people this is what you need to do to make change, but really ask the right questions mm -hmm. to get them to find the answers within themselves. So you know that Gandhi quote of uh, be the change you wish to see mm -hmm, in the world. Mm -hmm. It's it's over quoted to the point of like it's on way too many bumpers at, the, yeah. at this point. But yeah. um, it comes from his writings on Satyagraha. And one of the Satyagraha means um, the duty of of stepping into the place of discomfort stepping into what has to be done because mm -hmm. of love mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and what gandhi said is that the the reason he was committed to nonviolence is that there was no difference between the means and the ends and he said if we do violence what we're adding to the world is violence yeah yeah it's not that we can do violence and then say we're doing violence for peace Right. Because if you do violence, you add violence. Yeah. And so he said, we have, we're doing peace because our goal is peace. And that's what that idea of be the change, mm -hmm. like what you want to, what you want in the world, the ends you want in the world doing that. Right. And this is a very different form of, um, I mean, it's like the opposite of Machiavelli and kind of Western thinking, like ends justify the means. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. An eye for an eye. <laughs> right? And means yeah. and ends are the same. And so when you step forward in that place mm -hmm. of I am being aware, I am being intentional, I am being purposeful, it, it's not a, a, a power of like making people. Right. But it's a, it is a power. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that as we think about what's needed in the world right now, I think there are way too many people saying, I know the answer, do what I tell you. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there are way too few people saying, <clears throat> I don't know the answer, but I'm here to learn with you. Yeah. Because it's frowned upon not to have that answer. Right? We've been taught to have the answer or else we're wrong or we're ignorant or stupid or whatever the case may be. I absolutely love, um, I don't know if we talked about this during the book tour, but Daryl Davis, are you familiar with Daryl Davis? No. So Daryl is a um, international blues musician by night and then by day he's an activist and he he grew up in a family. His parents were, they worked for the U.S. Embassy. So he lived in all these different countries growing up. And he moved back to the States, I believe, in the late 60s, I believe in 68. And he was marching with the Boy Scouts in a parade. And he was carrying the flag. And he starts getting hit by debris by these spectators. So in his mind, and I'm, I guess I should mention he is black. And so he... He starts getting hit by debris and he thinks, um, man, these people don't like the scouts. <laughs> He's 10 years old. And it wasn't until his um, troop leaders came in and took him away from the scene that he realized, oh, it's me that they don't like. Why? And so he had this question from the age of 10. He wanted to answer, how can you hate me when you don't even know me? Mm. And I had him on the podcast episode two, and he kind of talked about this and I said, how did you not, how did that not turn into hate and resentment? Cause I feel like for most people it would, right. But that was the first time he had ever heard of racism, experienced racism because he had lived in all these different countries where he never dealt with mm. that. And the fact that he approached it with understanding and curiosity and kindness changed everything. He was mm. able to inspire, influence over 200, probably more now, KKK members to turn in their robes 
and denounce hate and racism. Mm. Um, not because he tried to change them, but because he showed them a new way of thinking and feeling about other people based on his actions alone. And mm. I think too many people, it, it's hard to be that person, right? It's easy to say you need to change, you're the problem. It's hard to see that all of us carry with us part of the problem, a piece of our big problem. We don't wanna see that reflection within ourselves. But um, as someone once told me, if you spot it, you got it. And, <laughs> and it's really true. Like it, you tend to see in others what you yourself struggle with. And when we become curious about that, within ourselves and say, what can I do to, to be the opposite of that? Um, it really does make a lot of change. I'm going to grab my charger real quick. So I'm going to pause for just a second because right. I don't know where it went to and I don't want this thing to die. <laughs> I was looking for one of my stickers that says, uh, all change starts on the inside, but <laughs> I don't see it. Okay. There we go. That worked out. Perfect. <laughs> Thank so in the, in the business space, um, one of the books that I wrote is called Inside Change. And the message of Inside Change is all change starts on the inside. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times working in, in business and in education and with parents and with couples, like who were like, I want them to do something different. Mm -hmm. I want, I want my salespeople to be more proactive. You know, I want my middle managers to be less compliance oriented and more, you know, leadership oriented. Right. I want my partner to empty the dishwasher, like whatever, like whatever it is, right? Um, and the message of this book, it, it, it's a business book, is if you want any of those changes to happen, you can, you can do that. You're going to have to make some changes first. Mm-hmm. So just for example, in a, you know, in a business context, um, I want my team to have more accountability. Okay. I have to have more accountability because if I don't show up more carefully about like following through on the things I say, I'm going to follow through on asking those questions, supporting, um, people to think about, or did we, you know, we said this, are we doing this? Mm -hmm. If I'm not accountable for that, they're not going to be accountable for that. Yeah. So I think this, this principle, all change starts on the inside. Adrienne Marie Brown is an intersectional environmentalist. Um, intersectional environmentalism basically is the premise that there is no such thing as climate equity without social equity. That part of creating a, a, a sustainable, healthy world is a sustainable, healthy ecosystem inside that world that includes human relationships. Mm -hmm. and, and that our systems of oppression are actually part of what fuel climate destruction. I mean, part of the reason we haven't solved the climate crisis is because we divide and create hierarchy and make us and them. And, you know, then it's like, Oh, well, those people. Mm -hmm. And as soon as we get into, well, those people. Yeah. Right. We have further div the division and it's harder to actually create change. Yeah. And so one of Adrian yeah. Marie Brown's principles in um, her, uh, the book they wrote is called, um, or I, I don't know if they've written multiple books, but one of the books is called Emergent Strategy. And I think you would really like it. One of the, there's nine principles of emergent strategy. And one of them is, Small is all. And what that means is change is a fractal process. Mm -hmm. And fractals are infinitely repeating patterns. This, the tiny, tiny pattern becomes the template for the macro pattern. Yep. And so small is all, like all change starts on the inside. If I want to have more just relationships in the world, I need more just relationships inside myself and with yeah. the people who are immediately around me. Yeah. That said, we have systemic issues. Mm -hmm. We have systemic issues around climate, around the way our economy is driven by extraction. Um, 
systemic issues around racism, sexism, classism, et cetera, et cetera, ism. Right. That doesn't mean those things aren't important. It means that the way we change those things is within ourselves and within our immediate circle. Mm -hmm. uh, Adrian Marie Brown talks about it as our flock. And if you think about the, the flock of starlings, you know, that seem to just so dynamically fly, each starling is actually only paying attention to the six starlings right around them. And that flock is in sync. And because this six and this six and this six and this six are in sync, the whole flock becomes in sync. Yeah. Have you, have you read the book, um, A New Earth? by Eckhart Tolle. I, I've uh, seen, I've read pieces of it, but I haven't actually read it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm familiar with it. I haven't completed it yet. I'm only on page like 30 or something. But just the first chapter, I'm like, yes. Like, it was just talking about, you know, when we lack that deeper level of awareness within mm. ourselves, everything else is tainted because we're so unconscious. We mm. are following these programs that are broken and we don't even realize it. We think those programs are who we are, yeah. but they're not. And it was talking about, you know, religion, how anything we touch that is inherently neutral can be, or something even like religion that was supposed to be meant for good, we even corrupt that to push our own agendas and condemn other people and to throw the label of right or wrong instead mm. of going to the core, the heart of it that says love, understanding, acceptance, compassion, humility, right? Yeah, I mean, when you look at kind of the fundamental tenets of all uh, um, all of the world's great religions, um, those uh, like fairness, um, just relationships, balance, you know, treat, treating treating others well mm -hmm. is part of what it means to be a good person, and having a having a, a harmonious relationship with each other and with the world. And somehow it's hard for us to do that. And during the um, um, Black Lives Matter uprisings last year, one of the questions that kept coming up for me was where is the leverage point for change? We look at all of these intersecting crises and we look at the level of polarization, not just in this country, but in so mm -hmm. many countries around the world. Um, the level of stress, the level of loneliness. Loneliness is at its highest level in recorded history of loneliness. Stress is at its highest level of stress. Yeah. And so where is the common ground in all of these issues? And, <clears throat> I mean, you know, maybe this is just you know, when your only hammer, when your only tool is a hammer, every problem is a nail. What, maybe it's that. But what I what I kept coming back to is we're so disconnected from ourselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we yeah. just get, you know, we become human doings instead of human beings. And we, you know, we're all so busy. And, mm -hmm. um, and actually, I felt a lot of hope that the pandemic created a pause for a lot of us to say, well, wait a minute. And there's so many people I've talked to who've said, like, are you ready to go to post-pandemic life? But I don't want to go back. I don't want to go back to normal. I want to go forward right. to something yeah, different. Yeah. yeah. So, I don't know. I think a lot of people are going to go back to being really busy and unconscious. But I, I think a lot of people are going to say, Actually, I want a deeper level of connection mm -hmm. with yeah. myself, with the world, with each other. Yeah. 
And it's terrifying because nobody wants chaos. Nobody wants to feel lonely or anxious or uncertain about anything. But sometimes it takes that level of discomfort and pain for us to do anything about it. And so I keep hearing from a lot of people, especially in the spiritual world, right? Like through this discomfort, through this chaos, we'll have a positive outcome um, because people will start to, to wake up to what's important to them. And that tends to happen with natural disasters too. Uh, I mean, and then you look at 9-11, you know, terrorist mm-hmm. attacks. Sadly, that brought people together. Um, for that time being, people started to help each other and, and not ask each other, are you a Democrat or a Republican? What do you believe in? Uh, they just stopped what they were doing and helped. And it's sad that we need something like that, or it seems that we need something like that to wake us up. But hopefully people will start realizing, you know, um, what's important in their lives. Not everybody will, but. Something that's been fascinating for me is, you know, in this story you told about Daryl Davis, there are some people who experience um, terrible things and they become closed. Mm -hmm. Um, They become bitter Mm -hmm. and they have a increased sense of separation, of otherness. Like the world is a dangerous place and I have to protect my own. Mm-hmm. And then other people, as you described with, with Terrell Davis, say, I need to understand. I need to build bridges. I need to connect. I was talking to one of my colleagues in the, the work. We do a lot of work together around the space of emotional intelligence and equity. And his name is Michael Eatman. And Michael and I have been working together a lot over the last few years. And one time he said to me, like, a, a lot of maybe wisdom is comes from going through a lot of suffering. And I, <laughs> what I said to him is I, I, I look at him as an example of somebody who's gone through a lot of suffering, but has it has led him to open his heart instead of close it Mm -hmm. and i just i feel like there's trying to understand what it is that supports us to open our hearts open our minds open our hands Mm -hmm. you know it's like closed parachutes don't do a lot a lot for us closed minds closed hands closed hearts likewise um so what helps us open And sometimes it's pain, sometimes it's conflict, sometimes it's disaster, but that's not enough. And one of the things that research says is one person, one shelter, one ally, one person who listens to you, one person who cares about you, one person who has your corner, um, makes a tremendous difference in people's level of resilience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I think that Like that is incredible to think like you, you know, you're at the store and somebody's being a jerk and like you can be that one person who like says, hey, you're not alone. And that's going to make a huge amount of difference. Mm -hmm. And I know it doesn't seem like very much, but that's a lifelong difference. Yeah. Being that one ally. Yeah. Uh, I have two stories around that. And the first one has a positive ending. The second one doesn't. And they're both dealing with me. (laughs) So uh, at the DMV, right, I'm in line and everybody says, I hate going to the DMV. Those are the worst people, blah, blah, blah. And so I'm just observing, like I'm watching the interactions between the clerks and the people walking up. And you can tell that most people just meet the clerk automatically with an attitude or some type of, you know, hostility, because I'm sure they go into it already having an opinion about that person. Right. And what that, what that usually creates is a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you meet someone with a 
poor attitude because you think they're automatically going to have a poor attitude, then you'll likely get what you ask for, which is a poor attitude. So when I went up to this clerk, I said, you know, how are you today? How's your day going? And a lot of people kind of say, hey, how are you, right? I mean, it tends to be one of those automatic exchanges, but I really meant it. And she said, you know, my day's going good. How's yours? I'm like, good. I said, you know, I've been watching you and you are just getting people in and out of here so fast. I was in line. The line was like so long. I was like, I'm going to be here forever. I said, but it is moving so fast. You were so quick. And, you know, a smile just came across her face just because she appreciated that. And I said, I hope I have everything for you. Because that was another thing I noticed was a lot of people weren't prepared with the right documents. And I said, I hope I have everything for you. I know it can be frustrating. Just acknowledging some of the things that I saw her dealing with and her attitude. I mean, her eyes lit up, smile on her face. As soon as I walked away, I mean, she just had a different attitude greeting the next person. And what's going to happen then? That person's probably going to meet her differently. And how long is that ripple effect going to go on? So that ended positively. <laughs> Let me just share a quote with you um, that I was thinking about as you were um, talking about that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's from Anais Nin. We don't see the world as it is. Mm -hmm. We see the world as we are. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and so this goes back to this thing about like the change starts on the inside. Yeah. Right. And this is a very, very old idea. Um, many uh, spiritual traditions, many wisdom traditions have said like part of what it means to grow up is to is to learn to see more clearly. And mm -hmm. that work starts inside us. Yeah. And I think as a coach, one of the things that I love about coaching is it's easy for me when I'm with a client, it's easy for me to see so much possibility to see like this person can do this. I just had a coaching session earlier today with somebody going through it, just an unbelievably difficult situation. But I, I just, I know she can do it. I just see the strength. And yeah. I would like to engage in the world like that more often. Maybe that's why I became a coach. Well, uh, I hate to put a damper on this wonderful moment, but I, I do feel like I have to share a, the other story because I don't want to present, I don't want people to see me as the person that always has it together because two weeks ago I didn't have it together. I intended to go into the situation just as I did with the lady at the DMV. And I did go into it that way, but it did not end well. And it's my fault. Uh, I was in Uptown Charlotte, and I feel like if you park in any city, it is just a nightmare, right? But I'm parking on this road, and one of the parking people is giving tickets. I'm like, well, I definitely don't want to park where I'm going to get a ticket, right? But there was nowhere for me to get near him to roll down the window and ask, where can I park? So I had to park like five cars away. And so I thought, well, I'm going to try to save myself some time instead of walking all the way down there uh, to just park my car and say, excuse me, sir, you know, to get his attention. So I said, excuse me, sir. And uh, he didn't turn around. And so I'm like, okay, maybe he doesn't. I mean, it's city traffic. Maybe he didn't hear me. So I say it two more times. Nothing. Doesn't acknowledge me. Doesn't turn around. So I'm like, okay. So I'm going to walk down to him now. I'm going to approach him. And so I did. I walked down and I said, excuse me, sir. And he turned around and he said, would you give me one minute? Would you give me one minute? And I'm like, okay. <laughs> you know, I'm like, kind of like, obviously I felt that like whoom, of that emotion build up inside of me. Like I what you know, what did I do? Um, so I'm trying to be emotionally intelligent, right? I'm trying to say, okay, it's not me. It's him. He's dealing with a lot of things right now. He's assuming that I'm being whatever. I don't know. Maybe he had a bad day. I don't know. So I'm taking that into account. And so I waited and he said, what can I help you with? 
And I said, I just wanted to know where I could park because I see you're giving tickets. And he goes, you know, you're rude. And I said, excuse me? He was like, you're rude. I have to enter all this stuff in that he had his little hand thing. And I'm, I'm thinking like, in my head, I'm thinking all he has to enter is the person's license plate, right? And I mean, what else, what all that, but to him, he saw me as just being demanding, I'm assuming, uh, interrupting, not respecting him. This is, this is what he's saying. I'm rude. And I said, well, sir, I didn't intend to be rude or disrespectful. I said, but you're assuming that I know what all your, your job entails and I don't. I said, but I was not intentionally trying to be disrespectful. And I said, it bothers me that you feel that way. And I said, do you really think that I would intentionally do that on purpose? He said, yeah, I do. I do think you did it intentional, intentionally. So then I get triggered because now this person is telling me what I intended to do. He's telling me I'm now not only am I rude, but I'm a liar, right? Oh, Josh, I was, tr I was, I'm like, running all of these things that I'm teaching other people through. <laughs> I my need head. to call Josh right now. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I'm like, well, sir, that is not at all what I meant. And I really don't. He was like, well, let me ask you this. Am I not entitled? I'm going to stop you there. I'm going to stop you there. Am I not entitled to my opinion? Can I not have my opinion? I said, well, sure, you can have an opinion. But that doesn't mean that your opinion of me is the truth. And I don't appreciate that you jump to that assumption. And uh, I said, you know, whenever you meet people, assuming that that is what their intent is, then you're going to, and he just walked away from me. Mm -hmm. He said, I'm busy. I got to go. Cause I think that was when it kind of hit him. He, he subconsciously knew he was wrong because I'm trying to calm him down. Right. And I feel like there was that inner conflict of he's still wanting to be right. And I'm, I am giving him rational information that he is not going to deal with. That's, that's and, what I'm thinking. Maybe not. And, maybe not. And it sounds like you also wanted to be right. I wanted to be understood because, mm -hmm. you know, I tell everybody behind every strong emotion is an unmet need, right? And my unmet need was to be understood. I wanted him to know that I was not a rude person, that I was not a liar. And until I felt, you're right, until I felt that I was understood, I was not going to be happy. Right. So and we go back, we go back to that Stephen Covey advice, seek first to understand. Well, yeah. And, and you're <laughs> right. You're right. You're right. I did not, you know, well, I, I, I tried to ask him questions, but when I reflect on it, it was like, I was more trying to get him to understand my point of view instead of saying like, you know, it sounds like you've had a rough day. I apologize right. that you felt this way. Empathizing yeah. with him and just letting it go, just letting it go. But so I this... didn't. So I got to finish the story because it did not end well. Oh no. It did not end well. Mm -mm. So when <laughs> I thought that was the not ending. No, well. <laughs> no, no, I wish. So when he walked away, from me as I am trying to, in my mind, calmly reason with him. <laughs> I, he walked away and I went to go to my car and I turned around without control at all and said, you know what? You get what you effing ask for. When you treat people like shit, you're going to get treated like shit. And then as soon as it came out of my mouth, I said, Brittany, what did you do? What did you just do? And I shared this on my YouTube channel because the hardest part for me was to realize that here's this person who is supposed to be emotionally intelligent, who wants to truly practice and embody what they preach. And I felt like a fraud in that moment. I felt like I cannot face people knowing that I did this without telling people that I did this. And so to alleviate that, that feeling of being a fraud, I just had to come clean. So I just created a video on my YouTube that shared the story 
Cause I don't want people to look at me and look up to me and think I'm perfect when I'm not. So yeah. Yeah. I, I going back to parenting, you know, and especially mm -hmm. parenting teenagers, there were so many, I mean, there were so many times when I messed up being somebody other than who I wanted to be as a parent, I had to write a book about it. There were so many of them for me. <laughs> but it's <just> like, <laughs> yeah. There's some I mean, good most, stories in that, yeah. that book starts out with my saying, I, you can read this book and learn how not to parent your children. <laughs> so for those of you who are listening and not watching this, I'm holding up um, Joshua's book, Wholehearted Parenting. So definitely check that out. It's a, it's a good read, but yes, you do share some stories in the beginning about some, some train, oopsie daisies, <laughs> some train wrecks. Yeah. I mean, there's so many things in this interaction that we could unpack. Um, one piece that I, I call this the first rule of emotional intelligence. When people feel pushed, they resist. Mm -hmm. So you and this person were both feeling pushed, right? And you were feeling pushed because of like, you're not understanding me. You're not, you're judging me. You're labeling me. You're um, not doing, <laughs> you're not doing your job. This person is feeling pushed. Can't you give me time? You know, I, I, this is hard for me. Like, so you both got, in that place of pushed and you both got into that place of resistance and that then went into this like escalation mm -hmm. and i think the important lesson for us be you know beyond that Brittany nicole's not perfect and neither <laughs> is josh um perfection is the wrong goal i think uh, being a learner is a more useful goal mm -hmm. but the, the understanding how that dynamic happens and it happens within a context right and so there's stuff going on around both of you that's putting you into that position mm -hmm. into that state to be more susceptible to those pushes and this i think is the the, the piece for all of us to really grapple with with what's going on in the world right now yes mm -hmm. you know in this heightened escalation this heightened yeah um sense of polarization and chaos means it's much easier for us to get out of your equilibrium mm -hmm. and it's much easier for all the people we're interacting with yeah and i'm so glad you brought that up and that was honestly what also bothered me after that event happened because i consider myself to be a very content happy you know I don't really, not much bothers me anymore. Right. And I also consider myself someone that tends to be very compassionate. And the fact that I wasn't in that moment, and I think that was what was lacking. I was trying to put into practice things, but what I wasn't embodying was that compassion. It was yeah. all about what to do next. Here's the next step. And that's why I try to pair compassion with emotional intelligence, because I think it, it takes a deeper sense of being and understanding and love than just going through here's the steps to not react right um because so, i think that's the only thing that's gonna help us in in this heated environment and a very practical piece of advice for people who are listening is that when we start getting escalated we start getting into that place of feeling pushed very, there are very few times in our lives when rapid reaction is actually important. Mm -hmm. You know, it feels like, oh, I've got to deal with this now. I've got to talk mm -hmm. to this kid now. I've got to talk to this employee right. now. I've got to tell my wife this right now. But most, 98% of the time, <laughs> like slowing down is actually going to be helpful. Mm-hmm. And the reason the organization that I run is called Six Seconds is this idea of a six second pause. And just like, okay, I'm just gonna slow down a little bit. And that creates a space for that compassion to, to come forward. Yeah, yeah. Oh man, I just, um, mm, I don't know. I, 
I wrote a, a post the other day. I was like, you know, I want to be an optimist. I really do. But with everything that has kind of came to the forefront or has been on my mind this past week, it's sometimes hard to see things turning around mm. when things seem to be going in the opposite direction. And uh, again, as we talked about earlier, like knowing my part and just focusing on what I can do instead of focusing on all the things that I don't have control over, right? Because as you said, it, it begins with all of us uh, internally working on ourselves. And remembering that optimism isn't the same thing as denial, right? Optimism does not mean, oh, just smile, it'll all be fine. Right, right. Right, optimism really means confronting how brutally difficult the situation is mm -hmm. and still holding on to the commitment that we can grow and do better and try again. Yeah. So I think it's important um, to acknowledge how painful this place is, this place that we're in, this season that we're in. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for you, the, the between environmental disaster and uh, social conflict and disconnection and big decisions and, you know, parking people <laughs> being <laughs> upset with you and like just all that stuff and saying, yeah, that's actually really painful. Yeah. And another and, thing I was reading, and I don't remember if this was um, a new earth or not, but it was talking about the ego and how the ego is what is afraid of the ego is afraid of pain, yeah. but the deeper self doesn't, you know, is very neutral to pain and pleasure. It just wants to grow and learn and expand. And so it's mm. getting comfortable with that discomfort and realizing that there's always something to learn and the betterment of the greater uh, good of humanity or the universe or whatever the case may be, right? Because we're not the only ones living on this planet. I, I say humanity, but we got to think about other things that we're impacting, other ecosystems. Um, so discomfort is, our brains really don't like discomfort. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, you know, whether it's ego and deeper self, I'm not sure. But I, I know that on a neurological basis, our brains are wired to avoid discomfort. And one of the things that has been useful for me is to remember that first of all, most of the time discomfort and danger are not the same thing. Mm -hmm. Right. Our brains treat them as the same. Yeah. And so we have discomfort and our brains go, oh, this is bad. Yeah. Um, so, you know, sometimes people will say, you've got to be comfortable with discomfort. And I'm not sure about that. I don't think that's how our brains work. But I think we can learn to distinguish different kinds of discomfort. Just like, I mean, when I was in physical therapy, I could absolutely, uh, I ruptured my quad tendon. And it was a lot, a lot, a lot of physical therapy for that. But I could learn, I learned to distinguish between pain that was part of the healing and pain that was making it worse mm. hmm. and that it's like well that's just painful it's not just painful there's different kinds of pain yeah and i think in the same way there's different kinds of discomfort and so for us to kind of be more nuanced to be more intelligent about these feelings and to be able to kind of tease apart and go oh that's this kind of discomfort that's this kind of sorrow. That's this kind of grief. And the way I'm going to respond to those is different. Mm. And, you know, I think that's one of the promises of emotional intelligence is that as we start to tune in, we understand more clearly what this message from us to us, what it really is. And then we can craft a response that's going to help us move forward. Mm. And that, I think that is a beautiful way to tie up, put a nice little bow on this episode. Um, but I will allow you, if you would like to add anything else, because 
We're at the well, top of the hour, but I would love for you to kind of give a little nugget if you would like. Well, I just coming back to the, 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 the struggle that you are in mm -hmm. and saying, I want to be optimistic and just one of the things that is hard is to honor what is. And if you are in a moment in your life where you're feeling grief and despair, that may be really valuable. Yeah. And it's like just saying, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm in that moment right now. And it is, is hard. And there is something to learn in the, that feeling too. And then re-engage the optimism. Yeah. The last time that that happened where I got into that pit of not just despair, but just there was a lot of, mm, it, there was a fire inside of me. I just felt like I needed to express it. And so I decided to write a book. I was just going to say, and then you ended up with a book I and did, a podcast. I, did. I was literally on the couch and I'm like, just, I, I can't take this. I, I looked at my husband. I was like, I'm going upstairs. I'm going to start a book. And I did. I just left the couch and went upstairs and started typing away all my frustrations just on the page and ended up being my book. So, you know, like you said, turning it into the positive. Yeah. But Josh, thank you so much for being a guest on the show. Um, as always, I absolutely love six seconds. I just, I can't um, just uh, express my appreciation for your organization enough. So I will definitely put a link to six seconds so other people can find all of your amazing resources and books and trainings and games and events and community. I mean, it's just, again, it's a little overwhelming because there's so much amazing, amazing stuff. You've even got research and all that jazz, but fantastic source for emotional intelligence. And thank you for sharing that and for all of your work to advocate for people to tune in and connect with their own selves. My pleasure. And next time, <laughs> hopefully there won't be a next time, but I am human, but next time you may get a call from me if I'm standing talking to a parking attendant. <laughs> Emergency coaching. <laughs> All right. Well, you have a wonderful rest of your day and I wish you all the best. Thank you. You too. Thanks.